home will be magnificent. It may shock you. I guess we should tell everyone what we're doing here again, right? Yes. Do you want to explain what the premise of this is? Yeah, I'm Coleman Lowndes. I'm Phil Edwards. This is History Club, where either Phil tells me a story or I tell Phil a story. So last time I told you this story, and now I have no idea what's going on. Right. OK, I want to start with a question. OK. Do you know what galvanism is? Calvinism? Galvanism, Cal with a G. No, I haven't heard of that. You've definitely seen it. Is this Frankenstein? Mm-hmm. You know this isn't real, right? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today, actually. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. That is an iconic scene from Frankenstein, the 1931 movie. OK. Basically, the one that every screen adaptation afterward is based on. Like, you've, you've seen that scene before, right? Yeah, yeah. Are you familiar with it? Or I've seen the young Frankenstein version of it. Also, classic, yep. It's alive! The scene is meant to recreate the moment that Victor Frankenstein's creature comes to life in Mary Shelley's 1818 novel. Frankenstein. But it's not exactly right. Because like the young Frankenstein stuff and scenes like this, we remember Frankenstein as this sort of unimaginable tale of science fiction, but 1818 readers wouldn't have seen it that way. It was actually pretty reflective of contemporary medical experiments, and it's going to take us on a morbid journey through science. <laughs> Whoa! Wow! <laughs> it's one of the strangest tales ever told. It deals with the two great mysteries of creation, life and death. The 18th century in Europe, as you probably know, is known as the Age of Enlightenment. Up until this point, scientific study wasn't really thought of as a useful endeavor, and is sort of like into amusing magic tricks. But sort of all at once, there were these unimaginable breakthroughs in chemistry and physics and philosophy. People began to see the universe as an organized system rather than sort of this like mystery guided by the heavens. And they wanted to understand more about how it all worked and what humans could take control of. I'm sorry, can you just remind me again, when was Frankenstein written? Um, it came out in 1818, just on the heels of the long 18th century, the long century of progress. Yeah, I mean, they've been swimming in this for 150 years or something like that. Yeah. Around the same time, dissection and studying anatomy was huge, and the human body was starting to be thought of as a sentient machine made up of complementary parts. The heart, for example, was equated to a pump because it circulated blood throughout the body and maintained our innate life force. And that actually brings us to the topic of drowning. Wait, to the topic of what? Uh, drowning. Oh, the drowning. Okay. And, and diagnosing death in general, because diagnosing death to this day is pretty tricky. And even like diagnosing life, like there's obviously a huge debate over when life begins, but also when life ends. This debate was really fired up in the late 18th century because there was a bunch of recorded instances of people who seemed to be dead suddenly waking up, sometimes after human intervention. Are we gonna get into bells on coffins? We are. I have a spot <laughs> in here for this, <laughs> yes. Most of these resurrections were victims of drowning, and that motivated the founding of England's Royal Humane Society in 1774. And I'm gonna send you just a picture of that. The Royal Humane Society was originally called, very catchy name, the Society for the Recovery of Persons Apparently Drowned. And they offered lessons in and rewards for reviving people who seemed to have died from drowning. Whoa. Really? They didn't have the benefit of the tools that we have now to detect faint vital signs. So the society was basically saying that it's hard to know for sure if someone is truly dead. And their motto to this day actually is, and I'm going to butcher this, Lateat Sintilula Forsan, which means a small spark may perhaps be hid. Oh, wow. In turn, the idea that you could be misdiagnosed as dead contributed to a growing fear of mistakenly being buried alive which you've written about. Yeah, I did a whole slideshow of different coffins that have bells attached at the top. So the idea there was that if you were stuck inside this coffin, you could pull on the bell, it would ring above ground, and then people would know that you weren't actually dead. It's persuasive. I mean, I would take a beeper in there with me. There were people too who were so afraid of being misdiagnosed as dead that they said like, when I die, cut my heart out, just to be sure. Shh. And actually, I want to show you this pamphlet, The Danger of Premature Interment. Wow. Oh, in 1816, so that's... Right around the corner. Yeah. So previously held notions of death at this time were becoming a bit more fluid. 
And with the whirlwind of scientific progress, people began to reevaluate how firm that border between life and death really was. And if drowning victims can come back, why not that next step? One of the most talked about and promising scientific phenomena of the Enlightenment was electricity. And this is actually where the work that would later influence Mary Shelley really starts coming into play. Galvanism. There we go, yeah. So in the 1780s, this Italian physicist, Luigi Galvani, experimented with applying electric shocks to the legs of dead frogs and found that he could get their muscles to contract for a limited time after the frog had died. And I'm gonna send you something else. In 1791, he published The Motion of Electricity in Muscular Strength, where he proposed the idea of animal electricity, which is the innate life force that animates living things. So he thought that we all basically, like if you chopped off my fingers, there'd be like cool electric beams radiating out, like you know, like that kind of thing. <laughs> Not quite like a RoboCop type situation. It was more of like a very subtle amount of electric fluid that is, is the spark of life, like is the innate life force. Okay. Later, Galvani's nephew, Giovanni Aldini, brought the experiments to a whole new level. He named the practice Galvanism after his late uncle and began experimenting with severed cow and sheep's heads. He could get these heads to open their eyes and move their mouths as if they were alive, which begs the question, could the recently dead be revived using electricity? The logic was, if the body is a machine and its innate animating energy is electric in nature, then it wasn't really out of the realm of possibility that a fully assembled corpse could be revived. You know, it, as long as all the pieces are correctly assembled. And that's exactly what Aldini set out to do in his most high profile experiment. So this is a really gruesome picture you got coming your way. Wow. An additional punishment for murderers after being hanged was that their bodies were immediately dissected for science. And in 1803, George Foster, a man convicted of murdering his wife and child, was hanged in London. His body was brought straight to Aldini, who, before an audience, attempted to revive his corpse. Wow. Yeah. Foster's face muscles twisted into a grimace and his eyes actually opened, but Aldini couldn't restart the heart, which was attached to its own battery, so the experiment ultimately failed. But Eesh. it was pretty sensational, and Mary Shelley would have heard about this. It was just a jolt of power. It wasn't any actual biological process going on, right? No, nothing biological. Some people were kind of convinced, but most of the people there were like, the heart didn't start and no blood was circulating, so he failed. Let's bring this back to Frankenstein. Okay. You're crazy! Crazy, am I? We'll see whether I'm crazy or not. Shelley never characterized her protagonist as crazy, or even a scientist. In fact, the word scientist hadn't even been coined at the time her book was published, and the idea of this experiment being unthinkable is just an interpretation of the story born out of hindsight. In the introduction to the 1831 edition of the book, Shelley made her real-life inspiration crystal clear, writing, perhaps a corpse would be reanimated. Galvanism had given token of such things. I think when this came out, it was much more terrifying than we think of it today, because we think of it as a silly monster tale. But this is just the next step in what was already happening in science. It's the near future. I had one other thing I wanted to do. Yeah. I was thinking it might be fun if this show had a catchphrase. We can think of some catchphrases now, and for the next one that we can do, we can pick a catchphrase from the comments. So okay. it'll be History Club, and then we'll say the catchphrase and credit whoever did it. I wanna say I'm ripping this off from uh, the podcast, Comedy Bane Bane. They do uh, user-generated catchphrases every single episode. I think it's a good idea. I wanna steal it, so. Okay. Uh, do you have any idea for a catchphrase? How does it used? Off? How do we use it? I don't know. We'll we just would just say be it like, together at the end. Welcome to History Club. Uh, <laughs> history Club, not your grandmother's history club. Oh, I like that. That's good. <laughs> it's fun. You know, it's like we're hip. History Club, where dusty books are sweeter than sugar. We'll workshop yeah. it. So give us a catchphrase uh, in the comments for our next episode. And thank you for watching this one. Cool. Yeah. All Sweet. right. High five. High five.